What an interesting way to communicate with students and families. Um, I am brand new to videotaping, so if you see me looking somewhere other than the camera, it's just because I'm getting used to how to best meet our needs as a school. Um, and I decided what better way to get started than maybe offering a read aloud and a potential Erla prompt uh, on the computer that you can access via YouTube. Um, I wanted to give it a try today and see how it goes. Um, I'm going to start out by reading uh, the book Wish by Barbara O'Connor. Pardon the mess. Uh, I have a project going on back there. And this is my studio slash brand new home office while I figure things out. So I figured the very first thing I would start with was a video read aloud. And we can start with that and see how it goes and maybe expand what we're doing into talking about the math in the packets or offering assistance as you ask questions. Chapter 1. I looked down at the paper on my desk, the getting to know you paper. At the top, Miss Willoughby had written Charlemagne Reese. I put a big X over Charlemagne and wrote Charlie. My name is Charlie. Charlemagne is a dumb name for a girl and I have told my mama about a gazillion times. I looked around me at all the hillbilly kids doing math in their workbooks. My best, best friend Alvina told me they would be hillbilly kids. You will hate it in Colby, she said. There's just red dirt roads and hillbilly kids there. She flipped her silky hair over her shoulder and added, I bet they eat squirrels. I glanced at the lunch boxes under the desks around me and wondered if there were any squirrel sandwiches in them. I looked back down at the paper in front of me. I was supposed to fill in all this stuff so my new teacher could get to know me. On the line beside describe your family, I wrote bad. What's your favorite subject in school? None. List three of your favorite activities, soccer, ballet, and fighting. Two of those favorite activities were lies, but one of them was the truth. I am fond of fighting. My sister Jackie inherited daddy's inky black hair, and I inherited his fiery red temper. If I had a nickel for every time I've heard the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, I'd be rich. Daddy fights so much that everyone calls him Scrap. In fact, at this very minute, while I'm stuck here in Colby, North Carolina, surrounded by hillbilly kids, old Scrappy is back in Raleigh in the county jail again because of his fondness for fighting. And I don't need a crystal ball to know, to, to know that at this very minute in our house in Raleigh, smack dab in the middle of the day, Mama is in bed with the curtains drawn and an empty soda can on the nightstand. She will stay in that bed Live all the live long day. If I was there, she wouldn't care one little bit if I went to school or stayed on the couch watching TV and eating cookies for lunch. But that's just the tip of the iceberg, that social services lady said when she rattled off the list of reasons why I was getting shipped off to this sorry excuse for a town to live with two people that I didn't even know. It's better to stay with kin, she told me. Gus and Bertha are kin. What kind of kin, I asked. She explained how Bertha is Mama's sister and Gus is her husband, and she said they didn't have any kids and they were happy to take me in. Then how come Jackie gets to stay with Carol Lee? I asked about a million times. Carol Lee is Jackie's best friend. She lives in a fancy brick house with a swimming pool. Her mama gets out of bed every morning and her daddy is not called Scrappy. So that lady told me again how Jackie was practically a grown up and will be graduating from high school in just a couple months. When I pointed out that I was in fifth grade and not exactly a baby, she sighed and smiled a fake smile and said, Charlie, you have to live, in Gus and live with Gus and Bertha for a while. I'd never laid eyes on those people and how was I supposed to live with them? When I asked how long I had to be there, she said, until things settled down and mama got her feet on the ground. Well, how hard is it to put your dang feet on the ground, is what I thought about. You need a stable family environment, she told me. But I knew what she really meant was, you need a family that's not all broken like yours. 
Still, I whined and argued and whined and argued, but here I am in Colby, North Carolina, staring down at this getting-to-know-you paper. Have you finished, Charlemagne? Miss Willoughby was suddenly beside me. My name is Charlie, I said, and a greasy-haired boy in the front of the class let out a sputtering laugh. I sent one of my famous glares his way till he hushed up and turned all red. I handed Miss Willoughby that paper and watched her eyes dart back and forth as she read it. Her neck got splotchy red and the corners of her mouth twitched. She didn't even look at me before she marched back up to the front of the room and dropped that paper on her desk like it was a hot potato. I slumped down in my seat and wiped my sweaty palms on my shorts. It was only April, but it was already hot as blazes. You want me to help you with that? The boy in the front pointed at the math worksheet on my desk. He had red hair and wore ugly black glasses. No, I said. He shrugged, took a pencil out of his desk, and headed up to the pencil sharpener. Up, down, up, down, up, down. That's how he walked. Like one leg was shorter than the other and he dragged one foot along the floor so that his sneaker made this squeaking noise every time. I glanced at the clock. Dang it. I had missed it. 11-11. I have a list of all the ways there are to make a wish. Like seeing a white horse or blowing on a dandelion. Looking at a clock at exactly 11-11 is on my list. I learned that from some old man who owned the bait and tackle shop out by the lake where Scrappy and I used to go fishing. Now that I'd missed 11-11, I was going to have to find another way to get my wish in for the day. I hadn't missed one single day of making my wish since the end of fourth grade, so I sure didn't want to miss one now. Then, Miss Willoughby nodded towards that red-headed boy sharpening his pencil and said, Howard, why don't you be Charlie's backpack buddy for a while? Miss Willoughby explained that when a new kid comes to school, their backpack buddy shows them around and tells them all the rules until they get settled. Howard grinned and said, yes, ma'am, and that was that. I had a backpack buddy whether I wanted one or not. The rest of the afternoon creeped along so slowly I could hardly stand it. I stared out the window while kids took turns bragging about their social studies projects. A misty rain had begun to fall and dark gray clouds hovered over the tops of the mountains in the distance. When the bell finally rang, I hightailed it out of there and headed for the bus. I hurried up the aisle and dropped into the last row. I kept my eyes on a piece of dried up chewing gum that was stuck to the seat in front of me while I sent laser thoughts zipping and zapping around the bus. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. Do not sit next to me. If I had to be stuck on a bus full of kids, I didn't even know. I wanted to at least sit by myself. My laser thoughts seemed to be working, so I took my eyes off the gum and glanced out the window. That red-headed boy with the up-down walk was hurrying towards the bus, his backpack bouncing against him with every step. When he got on the bus, I quickly looked back at the gum and sent my laser thoughts out again. Ugh, but that boy didn't waste a minute shuffling up the aisle and plopping himself down right next to me. Then he thrust his hand out at me and said, Hey, I'm Howard Odom. He pushed his ugly black glasses and added, Your backpack, buddy. Now, what kind of kid shakes hands like that? No kid I ever knew. He kept his hand there and stared me down till I couldn't help myself, and I shook hands with him. Charlie Reese, I said. Where are you from? Raleigh. Why are you here? Ugh, he sure was nosy. But I figured if I laid out the cold, hard truth, that that would shut him up, and maybe he wouldn't want to be my backpack buddy anymore. My daddy's in jail and my mama won't get out of bed. I said, well, that boy didn't even blink an eye. What's he in jail for? Fighting. Why? What do you mean? He wiped, up at his, wiped at his fogged up glasses with the bottom of his t-shirt. His face was flushed pink in the damp heat of the bus. Why was he fighting? He said. I shrugged. There was no telling why Scrappy was fighting. Besides, there was probably a bunch of other reasons he was in jail, but nobody ever tells me anything. Gus and Bertha told my mama you were coming. They go to my church and I gave them a cat one time, Howard said, a scrawny gray cat that was living up under my porch. Then he went on and on and on about how Gus taught him how to make a slingshot and how sometimes Bertha sells bread and butter pickles by the side of the road in the summer. 
how his mama drove her car right into the ditch beside Gus and Bertha's driveway one time, and Gus pulled it out with a tractor, and then they all ate barbecue sandwiches in the front yard. You'll like living with them, he said. I am not living with them, I told him. I'm going back to Raleigh. Oh, he looked down at his freckly hands in his lap. When? When my mama gets her feet on the ground. Well, how long is that going to take? I shrugged. Not long. But the knot in my stomach told me that was a lie. The worry clutching at my heart told me my mama might never get her feet on the ground. As the bus pulled out of the parking lot and headed toward town, Howard rattled off a list of school bus rules. No saving seats, no gum, no riding on the back of the seats, no cussing. A whole mess of rules that I was pretty sure nobody paid any mind to except maybe Howard. I looked out the window at the sorry sights of Colby. A gas station, a trailer park, a laundromat. Wasn't much of a town if you ask me. No malls or movie theaters, not even a Chinese restaurant. Before long, the bus was making its way up the mountain. The rain had stopped and wavy plumes of steam drifted up off the asphalt. The narrow road curved back and forth, round and around. Every now and then, the bus stopped to let some kid off at a pitiful looking house with a red dirt yard. When we were almost to Gus and Bertha's, when the bus stopped and Howard said, See ya! Another younger, red-headed boy got off with him. I watched them make their way across the weed-filled yard to their house. Bikes and skateboards and footballs and sneakers were scattered from the front door to the road. A garden hose snaked from a dripping faucet to a hole in the yard. A small, dirty-faced boy was dropping rocks into the hole and sending up big splashes of muddy water. Howard waved as the bus pulled away, but I turned my eyes back to that dried-up gum. When we finally got to Gus and Bertha's long gravel driveway, I got off and watched the bus drive away, making the rain-soaked Queen Anne's lace bob at the edge of the road. I was starting up the driveway when I noticed something shiny in the dirt at the edge of the road. A penny! I darted over and picked it up, then I hurled it as far as I could and made a wish quick before that penny hit the road and bounced into the woods. There, I'd gotten my wish for the day. Maybe this time it would finally come true. Friends, that concludes chapter one of a Wish by Barbara O'Connor. Um, it's one of my all-time favorite books, and I think that you'll really enjoy it as the story continues. Um, my early prompts for the day would be to make a prediction about what you think is going to happen next to the main character. Charlie. I can't wait to see you tomorrow. I hope that you are staying kind, staying positive, social distancing, because I want to see you sooner rather than later.